Welcome to uh, Black Men Speak. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Stewart, and this is the other co-host. Tommy Duncan. And today we're going to talk about black relationships. Um, and this is going to be a two-part series, so you know, please watch uh, part two to get the complete discussion. And Tommy, let's start our discussion with um, part of the, the way this came about was uh, there have been several stories by CNN, I think uh, Black in America one and two, there may be a three and four, who knows, where they interview a number of very attractive, talented black women who all have the same story that they can't find a good black man to pair up with. Um, and after analyzing the overall, it's not just as simple as there are not enough good black men out there. Uh, it's more, much more complex uh, uh, problem than that. But there's certainly, just overall number-wise, there does seem to be a shortage of good black men. So let's start a discussion and talk about why there's a shortage and what can be done about that. And then in part two, let's discuss more from a female perspective some of the things that uh, may be an issue there. So let's start with, uh, with, with our, our young men. I think to start with, we have far too many of our young men who are, who are dropping out of high school. You can't have a 40 or 50 percent high school dropout rate. And somehow I'd be surprised that some of the uh, universities, there's an eight to one ratio, or even more in some cases. Um, and with that much of a disparity from the college level, that's only going to bleed over into the professional level when, when those young men come out of college, that if there wasn't enough in college for all of the black women, there's certainly not going to be enough in the professional world for all the uh, professional black women out there. True, true. Yeah, it's a, um, it's a huge problem that we have in our community in particular. I mean, it starts, unfortunately, at a very young age. So, you know, young boys who are probably in the eight, nine-year-old uh, range are targeted, you know, in their fourth and fifth grade. And, you know, where most kids, I believe, especially <coughs> speaking, are operating at the level of genius uh, up through four years old just because their minds are a sponge and they capture everything and they're very curious. I mean, I think that's the beginning of genius. But by the time that they're four years old, um, young black boys are in a situation educationally where number one, they don't see a lot of uh, male teachers, much less black male teachers in right. their schools. The majority of their kids, unless they're in a uh, predominantly black uh, school, uh, in some urban, urban school districts, they're usually being taught by women, in some cases black or white women. And as a result, they don't see a lot of role models at a very early age, especially if they don't have a father in their home. Sure. And so as a result, a lot of our kids are being railroaded, especially young boys, into yeah, remedial classes yeah, yeah. Um, where their education is becoming, uh, at best, uh, very questionable. And so once I've found that you find kids who don't feel that education is the, um, is the aggressive track for their future, then they begin to get behind, you know, their counterparts of other cultures, and then they also get behind young black women as well, who've been far exceeding young black men in terms of graduating high school, uh, getting their degrees from college, etc. And so that pool of uh, young men begins to shrink at a very young age. Yes, it now, years ago, we uh, we discussed a book, Losing the Race, and the uh, I believe it was a Stanford professor who wrote the book. And that's one of the things he pointed out, that in his start in kindergarten, in first, second grade, and general up to about the third grade, young black boys perform quite well. They're, they're, in fact, they're the leader of the uh, performance boards. But by, by, you start, by the time you get into the fourth, fifth, and sixth grades, they're in the back of the class. And, uh, and by high school, they're already in, uh, out of uh, the whole system. They've dropped out of uh, many of them. And there has to be something in this whole process well, like you said, you can go from being very curious, very aggressive, wanting to dominate <coughs> and, uh, and forth what you know, to all of a sudden being pushed out of the system. You know, uh, I think part of it may be the mindset that, that he's not threatening when he's in kindergarten or the first grade. By sixth grade, this is already a criminal, as far as in the minds of the, some of the teachers. And they may not necessarily realize that they're pushing some of their belief system off on some of these kids. Then some of the kids may be responsible also with, uh, with their behavior or their dress uh, and some of the attitudes that they encounter in their communities because, let's face it, you still get a lot of kids 
We get accused of wanting to be white if they speak very good English, they have good diction, if they're making good grades. And then somehow it seems like society sends a message that a lot of these young males are, are receptive to that they're expected to be dumb and ignorant or they're expected to be cool and hip and not necessarily and have street sense, <coughs> not necessarily book sense. No, no, I, I agree with that. And so I, I think it's a complicated, multifaceted problem because um, mass media is the uh, probably the primary driver of the image of black men in America. It is. Uh, I mean, if you look at what's going on, not just on the television, you look at what's going on, on the billboard, you see uh, what's on the news, mm -hmm. uh, you see what's, you know, on their phones right Correct. now and are on their uh, electronic devices. It's a big problem because the image and the propaganda behind the black male is um, very divisive, mm -hmm. it's very confusing, and if you don't have anyone that, you know, draws the bar in the household, which is the father, the black male influence, a strong, constructive uh, black male influence in the household for young boys, then it's very easy to uh, fall off track. Uh, they don't understand what being a responsible male is. It's, it's you know, when we talk about the uh, the Willie Lynch letters, and it's basically you, you, you develop the body and you weaken the mind. Yes. And so as a result, if the only thing that, nothing wrong with that, if the only thing that they see that makes them successful is a physical dominance, whether you're gonna be an athlete, or you know, in some cases possibly an entertainer, or you know, mo think about this, Jimmy. Even though you have a few black shows on television that have a constructive male role model, the majority of what I see are primarily criminal elements. Thugs and gangsters and uh, drug dealers and one of, you know, that's all you see on TV for the most part. And the reality of it is, our presence on the television is not controlled by our community. It's not. And so there is another group of people who are creating propaganda and shaping the image and the behavior of what the black man looks like, what the black woman looks like, and therefore creating their reality. And so, and that brings up a very good point that there are few in Hollywood who can look at a script and turn it down and say, I'm not gonna play that role because it's a little degrading and I'm just not gonna put myself out there. Like, um, Angela Bassett. Yeah, so I'm gonna think about the, um, uh, what was the Monster Ball with Halle Berry. There you go. And then she may have been the third or fourth <laughs> actress they did turn to uh, for the role. Um, and I was watching, flipping through Netflix the other night, and they had a new Netflix series. And I'm like, okay, this, this may be kind of interesting. Until I saw the trailer for it. And it's about some young kids uh, in the Atlanta area selling drugs or trying to get into the drug business. Um, and I'm like, I'm just not going to watch another gangster series, young males selling drugs kind of a storyline. There had to be more to our existence than our young boys selling drugs. Right. It's interesting you bring that up, Jamie. I was <clears throat> looking at a trailer the other day. I wouldn't call it a blockbuster for the summer, but Superfly. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know if you remember I Superfly. Remember Superfly. Itself. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. During during the uh, the heyday of uh, black filmmaking Keep in the nineteen seventies. Keeping outdoors, talking crap to white people and the cops. Yes. Yeah, but there's a uh, Superfly movie that's coming out where you have a guy who obviously is going through illegitimate means trying to get to a legitimate means. But again, that's the image and propaganda that's put on the big screen concerning our kids, and that's the on the most part. I would say at least 70 to 80 percent of what our young black males see as to who they are. And, and for our young performers who try to make it in Hollywood, if these are the only roles they're, they're making available to you, if you're not a big star, sometimes you're, trying to, you're up and coming, you have no choice but to take the role in order to make a living right. and to uh, earn a paycheck. Yeah, there are very few Denzels or Samuel L. Jacksons or you know people of that stature who are at a place where they can pick and choose what yes. they're going to do and they don't have a financial fallout as a result of it. Or Fresh Prince. Um, True. <laughs> Will Smith. Who, who, who can pretty much uh, dictate the kind of movie he wants. Um, you know, I thought Seven Pounds was a horrible movie. Uh, uh, the one he made about the NFL concussions. Right. I think he, he did a good performance there, he just didn't like the script. Uh, or what. But when you're a big name star, you can make bad movies and still be okay. Um, when you're up and coming, you have no choice but to take whatever role that they give to you. And they seem to have more of these gangster role, thug roles available than anything else. So, um, which is why, which is another story we're going to talk about, we need to get into the uh, movie production business, start making our own movies. Uh, can't 
sit back and wait for Hollywood to make positive movies for us if we're not making them ourselves. Right, but, so, uh, now get, but, no, but getting back on track in terms of uh, uh, young black men and Imogen and rebuilding, uh, rebuilding the foundation for our young black men. And there are a lot of brilliant young black men who are doing very well. There are a well. lot, Tom. There are a lot. Unfortunately, we don't see them on the 10 o'clock news. And you don't, yeah, right. You don't see them on the 10 o'clock news. You don't uh, hear about the way too much. But here's, here's a more, more interesting thing is that I think if people realize that the young black male, like you said, is curious, aggressive, if you foster that, if you encourage that um, in reading and learning in a, in a very aggressive way, don't allow the schools to slow down the development at all. Don't, don't allow the schools to put your kid in special education simply because they can't teach your child fast enough to keep them interested in the, uh, in the curriculum. Then I think if parents start understanding that, that maybe we can turn this whole dynamic around where our young boys are more interested in finishing and completing high school and going to college than becoming a drug dealer. No, you bring up a very good point. I had a very good conversation with a, uh, a friend that I've known since college. As a matter of fact, we were probably freshman year, and she was she has two sons, both of them extremely smart. What she found out <clears throat> is that when her son was still in grammar school that um, you know they the teacher had put her and some other kids in what they called a club they call it a special club and really all it was was a, a remedial track in mm. order really to sidetrack them and I guess the message was this if she hadn't as a parent taken time to get involved with the PTA find out what was going on with her kids in the classroom asking questions she would have never known that a teacher had deliberately tried to put her kids educational track um, on a very rudimentary route, an extremely brilliant kid, you know, finished high school, went to college, but just the fact that parents have to get involved with their kids' education. They have to. They cannot just trust the teacher. Yeah, nah. And it's not, there are a lot of great teachers out there. My father was a career teacher, but you have to be actively involved with your kids' education. It has to be at least a three-legged school. You have to have the parent, you have to have a teacher, you have to have the kid, and they have to have con con constant uh, collaboration, but on top of that, you have to take ownership of your kid's education, and you can't just trust everything that an educator is saying about your kid. You have to know more than your kid than the teacher does. That is true, Tom. And uh, with my daughter and my son, it's a very true story. So she went. She she, she in middle school. She was in the uh, Plano school district, and they had everything mapped out from from junior high all the way through high school already mapped out and she was in all the uh, advanced classes I didn't allow her to take any of these fluffy electives so for electives she had you know uh, you know she would have calculus or math or or sometimes science class because I wanted to prepare for college and so that was the track that she was on up until the 11th grade and I didn't think anything of it um, so when we moved out of the uh, Plano school district into the Carrollton school and this is not to embarrass her, the Carrollton school district but she was in a a blue ribbon school. So it was a very good school. Um, and I'm thinking, okay, you got her records from Plano and that Judy's gonna her class is already mapped out, so we're just gonna continue on this track. As we know to me, um, they they look at her her no no okay, you don't need more math classes, you complete all your math credits and now your science credits and and now look up Tom and in her shooting year they have her in what they have her in? Um, building sets for drama class and in some math class where she saw oh, down in the, in the class with all the, the football players, you know, math of dummies, uh, basically what it was. Um, it's all these fluff classes that that they they they, they, they now put her in, and then her counselor is telling her, oh, don't, don't worry about college, don't worry, go you know, go to college, junior college is where you need to go. And you start thinking about junior college because those people going to college is just a lot of money being spent, um, and maybe a waste of time, and and, and so. Um, a lot of kids have better results going to junior college first. So that's what daughter won. By the time I figure out the damage is done at that point. And, uh, and, and so I'm asking the school, how do we go from someone who's taking algebra one and two, geometry, who's taking uh, trig, who's taking pre-calculus, who now is going to be taking calculus one now. How do we go from that to math for dummies? I, I, I don't get that progression, but she made all her math credits. Okay, but still, if you, if you follow the progression here, you don't go up the hill and then also go back where you started. Not just back where you started, but even below that. 
Um, and then my son, when he came out of high school, uh, his counselor told him he would be, be a welder. You know, you, you'll do well working with your hands. Uh, so you need to take up welding. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's all, that's all he needed to hear because uh, he's going to take the easy, uh, easy route out anyway. Um, so, and he never quite recovered because um, he's still a knucklehead today, unfortunately. Um, that's another story. But I, I don't think what happened to, in my situation, is a one-off. I think that's probably the norm for a lot of these kids who get really bad advice. And you're right, the parents need to stay involved with their what happened at school. Every semester, go to school and make sure that the classes have not changed, that the track has not changed, they have not put your kid in some special club, um, some remedial program or some track for dummies, um, I hate to use that, that term, um, or some special need program, because um, <clears throat> it will happen, and it may happen and you don't even realize it. So paying attention to what's going on is important, like you, uh, like you said. But on top of that, pushing your kids, like you said, setting the bar really high. And I think as a community, we need to also let the parents know that it's okay to set that bar really high. I think a lot of parents think that they need to make it easy for their kids because they're, they're trying to be friends with their kids as opposed to being parents to their kids. Uh, especially with young black boys, there is no easy way to do this. You have to be aggressive, you have to be disciplined, and you need to be hard on them sometimes because a sign of softness may mean that you, they stop listening to you. They stop paying attention. They, uh, they lose respect for you. So a strong male figure in their life, someone's going to put their foot down and, and mean what they're saying, say what they're mean, is what some of these young boys need um, with that kind of a rock in their life. It may not, if the father's not there, it could be an uncle, it could be a brother, it could be someone else, even somebody from the community. If you have to go borrow a dad to uh, be dad to your kid, uh, I would suggest uh, women look at those options. But even other black men who, you know, who may not have kids or even have children, if you have time to mentor uh, some black male who doesn't have a father figure in his life, we have to all start doing what we can to uh, turn this thing around because we're losing far too many boys to the prison system. No, I'd agree. And I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, it may not be a, a very uh, easy thing for people to swallow, uh, but, you know, for a lot of our kids, most of which are being born into a single female headed household, we've got to. Uh, We've got to turn the corner on having kids oh, yes. into a single female headed household where there is no um, father involved in the equation. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of women who have been very successful and they don't have a, a man per se who are in the equation long term and so they decide they want to have children. There's nothing wrong with having children, but I believe it honestly takes two strong parents. It does. And it's difficult for two strong parents to raise a kid, a healthy kid who's well balanced, who's aggressive, uh, but doing it by yourself it's yeah. very difficult, not impossible. We have a lot of not women, impossible. Uh, a lot of great women yes. who've done a very good job of raising their children, but I don't know that I can talk to any of them who said, you know, if I had to do it over again, if I could, you know, start a little bit earlier, find a husband, find the right man uh, to help co-parent this child, then I think it would have, one, been a lot easier, not just on the kid, but on myself as well, because you have uh, a parent who's fully responsible for a child, but you know you have no one who's responsible to take care and her, nourish her as well, which makes both of them a lot better because there's typically things that a mother's going to bring to the right. equation in terms of being a, being a parent, then there's something that a father's going to bring. Be correct. Exactly, in terms of being a parent. And I think that that actually produces a more well-rounded young man or young woman right. for that matter. I don't think you're right. I think in both the uh, young male and young female case, you're right, both parents being there, the mother is normally the emotional hub of the family. Exactly. Uh, so she brings the emotional security and stability that you need for people to feel secure. But then the dad brings the security piece to it, um, that you feel protected with dad there, um, financial security and even physical security. But then he's also <clears throat> Brings the discipline that's needed. You know, you know, fathers tend to be more of a disciplinary than the mothers uh, in a lot of these uh, two-parent households. And then the other thing, Tom, is um, that we haven't talked about this in a while, but if this thing doesn't turn around soon, I mean, really soon, um, and I know we've kind of half jokingly talked about it, but we may, as a community, a black community, may need to embrace polygamy as an answer at some point. We may just not have enough black males to go around for the number of black females who want a good black man. And if that's been the case, 
rather than some woman go all her life and never have the experience of a good black man in her life, it may be time to double and triple up, it may be even quadruple if we don't uh, get this thing turned around. So people out here listening, you know, let's, let's start taking the steps right now for those of you uh, who are somehow offended by the thought of polygamy, but the reality is, is that if uh, this continues on the path that it's on, really what choice will we have? Well, Jimmy, I mean, uh, it's, it's an interesting thought. I just don't believe that you're going to find a majority of uh, women who are going to allow, adopt and, a every, every woman wants her own. Even, even, there, even, if it was, even if it is an ideal situation, <laughs> where are you going to find <laughs> women who are going I, to adopt I, 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 totally, I totally understand, but if, they're, if, they're, if the shortage of black men is so severe, and, and a lot of black women do not want to date outside of their race, which I've heard, a lot of black women say. Well, I think that there's, we're starting to turn the corner on that. I think that one of the biggest arguments, in, a, in certain cases, frustration of black women is they see black men who are dating and or marrying white women, and you have all these great black women out here. And um, I think I'm starting to see now a lot more black women who are, let's say, resolving that they will date outside of their race probably more black men dating white women or women of other ethnicities, whether it's white, Hispanic, Asian, or Indian, than you do black women. But I believe that there are you know, more black women now who are resigned to the faith that they may have to find someone outside of their culture. And then outside of the educational system, Tom, the other piece is um, a lot of these young black males have been raised by single by mothers with no male figure or father in the household. Some of, them, some of them lack the knowledge on how to be a real man. But everything they know about manhood came to them from a woman right. uh, or from women, because sometimes there's a grandmother or, or aunts involved. In the case of my son, uh, that was his situation. He was, he was raised by his mother for the most part, and his, um, his grandmother and his aunts around him, and they babied him and took care of him. And, you know, and as a result, as he got older in life, he began to expect that this is the way the world operated, that men just naturally had women around them to take care of them. So, of course, when it's time for him to leave home, where does he go? He goes to his aunt's house, he goes to a cousin's house, he goes to live with his sister, he goes to live with his aunt, his grandmother. The common denominator in all those scenarios, he's always living with a woman who's taking care of him. Jimmy, he put a roof over his head. You're, you're right, and it, it is... Um... He, and even when he had his own place a couple of times, he didn't feel comfortable being on his own, being responsible for himself. He always gave that up to go live with a woman. Jimmy, I, uh, I, I hate to do this, but I'm going to have to agree with you on this one because uh, I, not just with older women, but even with younger women. I have a young cousin who is in her uh, upper 20s right now, college educated, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, very, very impressive, very smart young lady. But she was saying that, you know, a lot of the guys, the young guys, that she runs into now looking for a woman to take care of <laughs> take now, care A, them. a yeah. woman is taking care of them all of their life, their mama, their aunt, or whomever, mm -hmm. and they have become emotionally attached to a woman as opposed to leading. Yes. And this is a result of not having a male to show them how it's done. That's true. But ultimately, she <laughs> it's amazing. She said that a guy read, you know, came up, talked to her, asked her for a number. So a couple of weeks, you know, they had talked a couple of times. He he asked her for some money to replace his shoes because he had bought these high price shoes. He didn't have much money, he didn't have enough money for his rent. And if she would borrow, let him borrow some money to pay his rent. Because, I, he, I paid, because, he, because he paid too much money for a pair of new shoes and he can't pay his rent. That's ultimately irresponsible. Very irresponsible. But she said that is a common thing. Men who are looking for women to take care of them, and it's not just the young ones. Some of the old ones as well. I have heard of women, you know, even mature women into their 30s and 40s who are taking care yes. of men. Yes. And again, that goes to your point. Strong body, weak mind, irresponsible. I'm not saying that there are, most of the men are like that, but there are way too many. And if Tom. I ask, if I ask a fair share of women, they are going to give you the same story. You can't pay your rent because you spend your rent money on shoes. Absolutely. Okay, that's an emotional, impulsive decision Absolutely. that you normally expect women to do things like that. Right. That for a man to be disciplined and responsible enough to say, at the very least, let me pay my bills first, and then if I have some money left over, I'll see if I can buy some shoes. Right. 
The only thing they need is a spare job, not a pair of spare shoes. <laughs> uh, this, this is uh, not a laughable situation, but it's really sad. But you're right, I didn't, I, I didn't think about the, when you, when you talk about the emotional connection piece, but you're right, a lot of these boys grow up, and they're not even young men, they're just really just boys in, in men's body, grew up in a situation where they are emotionally attached to a woman who takes care of them. The daughters are being raised because they're expected to go off and make good grades in school, to go off to college, to go set themselves up in life without having to depend on a man. But what about the young, the young boy in the household? What is he, how is he being raised? Well, he's being taken care of. Mama and sister you know, cooking, you know, she's paying the bill, she's putting a roof over there, she's putting money in his pocket for him to go out. When he brings home a bad report card, she doesn't really care that much. Right. Well, that's just a system, you know, we know it's unfair against black boys. But for the daughter, she's expected to bring home good grades. Right. For him, you know, well, if you get to go out and get a job and do something with your life, great. For her, <clears throat> you know, you expect to go off to college, make a career, because mama now is a role model to the young girl who went to school, who has a job, who's working hard. For the young boy, mama is just that person who provides a way for him. She's a woman who's making a way for him. So in his mind, this is just how the world operates, that women are expected to take care of the men. And it's a, it's a sad role of reversal. My grandmother predicted this when I was a little boy, when uh, she was trying to teach me how to cook, and I want to go out and ride a bike and play ball, and she had me to chopping and peeling stuff, and, she told me, I said, well, you know, mom, when I get grown, when I grew up, I'll just marry you. My wife would do all this stuff. I don't even know how to do it. And she said, one day, the, you know, you're know, going to live in a world where men cook and women don't. And you need to know how to take care of yourself because it's going to be this role reversal. And that was back when I was five or six years old. And now this, we're living that age now where you're going through the role reversal where men are no longer expected to take care of household. Women take care of household. And you know, there was a time when you kind of expected a woman to be the happy homemaker and to take care of the kids and children the household while the men go out and work. Now women are going out to work. I don't know what the men do at home because they don't take care of the house because I hear women say that not only do they work, but then they have to come home and cook and clean when the lazy guy's been home all day long. What do you do? So I, I don't quite get this scenario, but all I know for, for women out there who find yourself in this situation, look, if it doesn't turn around here soon, the next generation, then your daughter or your grandchildren may live in a world where polygamy may be the only answer to save the black community. And that, that's reality. So, and we may talk about that in a future show, Tom. Um, this whole polygamy angle as a cure for the black community because if we really can't fix the situation where there's more parity between young black men and young black women, like you said, most black women who are professional women want some work so sort of in the same level, doing sort of the same thing, earning the same kind of money that they're earning, so together they go do something. If you know she's a, if she has a hundred fifty thousand dollar salary and you're making you know uh, 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 eighteen fifty down there at the uh, at the grocery store, that may be a problem. You may be a very good guy, but and, and you may even have some leadership qualities. You may be the kind of guy you can depend on, but that income level, that income gap, is going to be too much. Even if she's not tripping about it, in his mind, she's the breadwinner. And, yeah, then, true. and true. then his little money that he brings to the table doesn't amount to a whole uh, lot when it comes to <clears throat> what they're doing overall. And they may always feel inadequate for that. So I agree. Um, and I think it's, it's a problem uh, for both the woman and the male because most women are going to be looking for a man who's doing at least as good, if not better than them. Yeah. Otherwise, they're not going to concede leadership in that household to <laughs> someone who's not, who's not making the type of money that they are. And that, that's, at the end of the day, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a. Don't blame us now. We're just the messengers. <laughs> so, we'll just tell you how things are, not that we make the rules. So, right. So, ultimately, Jimmy, think about this. If from this day forward, Every child that was born into our community had a mom and a dad married together. It would still take at least a generation, generation at least 20 generation. years to clean out yes, everything. That is true. So uh, with that being said, we're, uh, we're almost out of time here. So let's wrap up part one. We're going to come back uh, with part two and continue the conversation. But we're going to talk a little bit more about what's going on with, uh, with the women um, in this uh, equation. And this won't be the last time we'll talk about it. Like I said, the... The issue is a very complex one, so it's going to take many, many, many episodes 
to just be able to, to scratch the surface and discuss it fairly. So let's um, give a shout out to our thank to our sponsors, Fitness 360 for allowing us to use the building. And MOTC Telecom for sponsoring our show. And to uh, Forest Film for doing our editing and uploading uh, to YouTube. And we thank you, of course, for our viewers just like you. And I should, please uh, I encourage others to, uh, to, uh, to watch our show. And please subscribe. We need the, uh, the subscribers and the viewers. So from uh, Black Men Speak, um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. That's all, folks. <laughs>